everyone. I'm Mike Hastie. I'm with Seacoast Peace Response. Uh, we are co-sponsoring this panel discussion tonight with uh, the UNH Peace and Justice League. And to reserve the room, I want to start off by uh, thanking, first of all, you all for attending. Uh, I want to thank our panelists for showing up with us. We have a very distinguished panel. Uh, I'll introduce them shortly. Um, I want to thank the members of Seacoast Peace Response and the Peace and Justice League. Uh, especially uh, Griffin Sinclair Wingate and Chris Grimley, who worked very hard to put this together. Uh, thank you to Daniel Grimley, Chris's dad, who was a graphics artist who designed that fancy poster you've seen around here. Uh, thanks to UNH and the MUB staff. And this is an important and timely subject, as you all know. It's less timely than it was a month ago, thanks to the fact that the tensions have decreased in Ukraine uh, due to the success of the Minsk Agreement. And the fact that both sides are pretty much adhering to the ceasefire that was agreed to. Uh, the new Cold War has been the subject of several books and literally thousands of articles in recent years. Uh, if you Google new Cold War, you get over 500,000 hits. Uh, for the people of my generation, the Cold War was a defining issue, a defining issue of American foreign policy. Uh, Dr. Ingram here probably remembers, like I do, uh, diving under my elementary school desk uh, <laughs> in exercises, uh, which is what you were supposed to do if a nuclear bomb hit. Uh, uh, that's something that most of you students probably never had to do. Um, something that was interesting to me as I did research in preparation for this panel is that uh, recent polling shows the uh, parallel growth and dis in distrust of each other's nations by the American and Russian peoples. It just, this has just gone on in the last couple of years. <clears throat> in Russia, in 2013, a poll had uh, the Russians with a 45% favorable view of the United States and a 38% unfavorable. In 2015, that has degenerated to a 13% favorable and an 81% unfavorable. What's interesting is that the same thing has happened in the U.S. In 2013, the American people had a 50% favorable opinion of Russia and a 44% unfavorable. Just two years later, now in 2015, we have a 24% favorable and a 70% unfavorable. This dramatic shift in public opinion and the multitude of reasons why it occurred provide the backdrop for tonight's discussion and highlights why it is important for us to understand the dynamics of the new Cold War. Fortunately, we have a distinguished panel here to help us toward this understanding. Our panelists are Lionel Ingram, the Merklin Lecturer in Political Science at UNH and a West Point graduate who received his PhD from the JFK School of Government at Harvard. Dr. Ingram has extensive knowledge of the Russian political system and teaches graduate courses on world politics and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, next to him is Jan Katowski, also a lecturer in the UNH Political Science Department, and he'll address the issue from a European perspective. Dr. Katowski is an expert on contemporary European politics and the role of nationalism in world affairs. Uh, our third panelist is Will Hopkins at the end. Uh, he's the director of New Hampshire Peace Action and the New Hampshire Peace Action Education Fund. Peace Action is a national organization dedicated to the nonviolent resolution of international conflict. I should mention that both Seacoast Peace Response and the Peace and Justice League are local affiliates of New Hampshire Peace Action. Mr. Hopkins is a combat veteran of the Iraq War and served on the National Board of Veterans for Peace. Let's please give a warm welcome to our panel. Our format tonight is we're going to have an open opening discussion. I'm going to ask a few questions and uh, then we'll open up the uh, questions, questioning to the audience here. So I'm going to start with uh, Lionel Ingram. And uh, the first question, and then we'll move on down the line. Each uh, panelist will answer the same question. Former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev has described the relationship between Russia and the U.S. as a new Cold War. This term has also been used by analysts in the West. Are they right? Are we in a new Cold War? Well, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I was defined. Am I on? Good. Mm -hmm. Good. I was defined in large measure by the Cold War. I was a 
second class cadet when the Berlin Wall went up and I was in Germany at the time. And just after I left my last assignment, just before I retired, um, I was a guest of the Commander-in-Chief, the Admiral-in-Chief of the Baltic Fleet of the so Soviet, or in that case, at that stage, the Russian Navy, in the Baltic Fleet, in a boat they had, or a small ship, they had in Copenhagen, Copenhagen Harbor. So in between the two, I sort of experienced it all. I never got under the desk. I'm not exactly sure what was wrong with my school. But let me look at the, this Cold War thing and try to put it in somewhat of perspective. Let's look at Russia. Russia today, sir, in size is smaller than it's been since the 18th century. They've been shrunk by their own choice, at least by the Soviets' own choice. <clears throat> their military is a regional military, with the exception of their nuclear weapons and perhaps their submarines. The ideology which we were concerned about in the, in the 40s and the 50s and perhaps into the 60s is no longer uh, a world beater. Uh, people have moved beyond Marxist-Leninism or at least the Stalinist stage of a type of it. Uh, the Soviet and the Russian people are no longer as cowed as they were or as controlled as they were, uh, though the numbers we hear here are surprising why they think like that. Uh, they certainly aren't. Uh, the Soviets that we might have remembered in the 50s and 60s. So the Russian situation is very different than the Cold War. And so let me shift from there and suggest some possible goals that Russia might have. And I'm not going to talk about Putin. I don't know if Putin is the leader of Russia in the sense that he makes all the decisions. I'm a firm believer the decisions are rarely made and carried out by single individuals. And I'm not sure who Putin is working with, but he's a very simple character like we tend to talk about Obama or Churchill or all the rest of the people in times past. Let's look at three possible goals. Number one, what Russia would like to have is effective control over what they call the near abroad, the states which were part of the Soviet Union until the Soviet Union fell apart. Does that mean they really want to get control of the three Baltic states? I would say no, but they are part of the concern. So number two, Russia would like to be able to play a role within world politics commensurate with its size, interest, attitudes, and that means it's going to be aggressive when it's got interests it wants to support. And we need to recognize that, and I would suggest that's been part of the problem we've had. We tend to forget that they are a state with interest, and we sometimes forget that we might get a little too close to theirs and step on them. And the third item is where the United States gets act, actively involved. There's no question in my mind that the current Russian administration is eagerly seeking to reduce American influence throughout the world as best as they can. Uh, when, world, when the Cold War was over and this bipolar world disappeared, a lot of people said we'd go back to the balance of power concept and we'd end up everybody balancing American uh, power. Uh, there's an element of that underway today. We do not have the sway that we had in the 50s, 60s, 70s, perhaps. And I think Russia is part of the activity. It's, let's just keep the U.S. a little bit lower on the profile. Let's don't let them be dominant, and especially perhaps dominant in areas where the Soviets, excuse me, I come from the wrong generation, where the Russians are concerned about. They do not want to have democracy as we see it. They do not want human rights as we see it, at least in large measure. They do not want us to dictate to them, or they do not want to perceive that we're dictating to them how they should live. Russia has always been on the border between a European state and an Asian state, and a state or country or society that's been different in itself. So if we start with these and use this as the basis of thinking about a Cold War, I think we might end up with less of a concern about the Cold War, and that's a term that's suitable for the past and not for today. So I'll turn it over to a man who might argue very differently from me. Thank you. So I would like to focus probably on this historical analogy of what used to be a you know, handy description perhaps for the historical period from the 1950s to the late 1980s and what we have today. And it's it's certainly not the same thing. 
if we say that there's a new Cold War, uh, that doesn't make any sense if we believe that there is uh, a repeat of a bygone historical period. So why do people use the idea of the new Cold War? Um, well, I would argue it's, it's mainly due to a few select similarities that make people forget all the differences in the current situation. Um, as uh, Dr. Ingram rightly pointed out, today's Russia is a much less powerful state than the Soviet Union was, and we do not have a bipolarity of power in the international system. It is not that the international system today is controlled by two um, overarching states. Um, we arguably still live in an area of unipolarity. Um, but what we do see, and I think this is where the idea of the new Cold War comes from, is that the actions of one state cannot be met by a response of another state in the same way that it would perhaps be happening if there was not some level of similarity between the two major players. And this is where I believe we have to talk about the issue of nuclear weapons. Um, very clearly, however you perceive the Russian actions in Ukraine, be it as a legitimate response to um, you know, perhaps an encroachment of NATO into a Russian sphere of influence, or simply an aggressive foreign policy by a neo-nationalist regime. The fact that the West and the fact that the United States cannot respond to Russian actions in a way that would, you know, basically be what they want to do, namely retaliate, is simply fa due to the fact that Russian power is still largely based in nuclear power. And nobody has any interest in escalating what is seen as a regional problem into a much larger conflict. Um, so those similarities between the actual Cold War and whatever it is we have now are what I believe may lead some people to talk about a new Cold War. Outside of those power relationships, um, I do not see major similarities that would warrant that comparison. And I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. I'll probably be a bit shorter than <clears throat> either. Um, and the reality that uh, Russia is so much smaller. We're talking about 10% of the military spending of the U.S., uh, less military spending than China. Uh, means that they're, they're, they are certainly in conventional warfare, not, uh, they, they are not a polar opposite. There's no, there's no uh, equivalency between U.S. Uh, conventional military power and Russian military power at this, uh, in this stage in the game. Uh, but the nuclear weapons issue does mean that there's going to be a certain standoffishness um, that, that also um, it doesn't uh, necessarily have some of the uh, aspects of the Cold War that we're not going to, we're probably not going to see the same kind of spending on nuclear weapons uh, and the same kind of buildup of spending on conventional forces uh, because at this point we, we've, uh, we've reduced through the two START treaties down to about 5,000 warheads, but that's still arguably enough to destroy all life on Earth uh, several times over. So we're, we're not, I, I don't think we're gonna see the same kind of spending or the same kind of mindset. Um, and I think that there's an incentive not to engage in quite the same way. Thank you, why don't we start with Jan for the next question. Uh, uh, Gorbachev, the Soviet former president, uh, who has in the past been critical of the government of Vladimir Putin, has in recent months assigned most of the responsibility for increased tensions between the U.S. and Russia on the, quote, avid militarism and, quote, triumphalism of the U.S. Is he right? And if not, why not? Well, this seems to go to the heart of the matter um, in that for a lot of people in the Western world, it was kind of taken for granted that Russia would be okay with a new role, a regional role um, that would pretty much go against whatever it had been in the past. Now, from the perspective of Russia, um, it's easy to see why and if 
we talk about um, U.S. militarism or triumphalism, uh, by extension, we're talking about NATO here. On some level, it is understandable to see why uh, Russia perceives Western action in that fashion. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that it was, in reality, a militarist response towards Russia. Um, so it, it really boils down to whatever you perceive to be a legitimate sphere of influence for both blocs. Um, from a European perspective, NATO is perceived as not only a guarantee for regional security, but very much an almost natural expansion of the Western model. Um, and it is perceived almost as a natural progression that more and more states are going to join it. Um, indeed, that failed to see what an expansion of NATO would mean for perceptions in Russia, because they are perceived as an encroachment into their sphere of influence. Um, that in turn means that um, the one solution to that problem of perceptions failed. There was not a necessary level of genuine dialogue between the two blocs that would have been able to negotiate a sustainable solution for a post-Cold War order of Eastern Europe. Uh, certainly, there were attempts um, towards dialogue, but and this is probably where NATO and Western powers have to take some blame. Um, that kind of fizzled out, and eventually it was perceived that, you know, we're just going to go ahead with our plans. Um, now, that does not legitimize the Russian response, right? but it offers some explanation for why that response by Russia became quite as aggressive as it turned out to be. Sure. Uh, I don't have too much to add. That was a great answer. Um, I, I, I think Gorbachev's statement here, the, um, you know, that saying that most of the responsibility for increased tensions between the U.S. and Russia uh, on the avid militarism and triumphalism of the U.S. Is he right? Uh, I don't know about most. Uh, I think there's, the, the, there's a role there. Um, you know, the, the tensions when it comes to the Ukraine, I think, is largely uh, cultural in the Ukraine. There, there's a very major linguistic, ethnic, and cultural difference between Eastern and Western. Um, so the tensions, you know, is NATO expansion part of the problem? Absolutely. Um, is uh, the internal struggle, are, are the inter internal struggles of the Ukraine a part of the equation? I, th I think so, and uh, certainly the actions of Russia play in as well. Well, we tend to look at two sides, and there are at least three. When I was in Lithuania, the Lithuanians didn't want the Russians there. They didn't want them there in 1945. They didn't want them there in 1989. They didn't want them there ever. And the Russians were there. And one of the problems that was created in Lithuania, the Russians came and moved Lithuanians out and moved Russians in. And so you now have a population which is about 25% ethnic Russian. Same thing, in worst cases, in the other two Baltic states. NATO didn't expand. People wanted NATO to expand. If you were a Pole, you didn't want to have the Russians on your, your backyard. And they were. They're in, right up there in Kaliningrad. If you're a Czech, you didn't want them there. Or if you're anybody on the East, you did not want them there. And NATO, to large measure, was a way, a counterweight to what the Russians might have turned out to be. So we were sort of invited there, and that has to be remembered. But the sort of invited doesn't mean that we had to come in in the same fashion that perhaps we did without thinking carefully, especially in the Ukraine. Getting into the three Baltic states, they wanted us eagerly there, and they were former Soviet republics. Ukraine is a former Soviet republic. Poland and all the rest of the states that we came in were satellite states taken, conquered, whatever you want to look at at the end of World War II. 
they were, in my mind, legitimate members. I'm a little concerned about NATO, and my concern there also extends to the fact that how the, the EU sort of walked into this exercise when we had the problem, that, that we didn't play it well, we being in the West. There is a problem there, and that was getting a little too close to Russia's legitimate concerns. I don't want, don't want to compare them to our so-called uh, doctrine of keeping the Europeans out of Western, out of the United States and out of the Western Hemisphere. Now, that's a little bit too strong a statement. But this was an area where there had to be a gray overlapping between interests of states. As John pointed out, they have a legitimate interest there. And they have a legitimate concern <coughs> about what NATO could do. One of the problems that happened to the Russians was when they, when, at the end of World War II, they created a buffer. They've been talking about buffers since Captain the Great. They might have been talking about buffers since they threw the Tatars out. And all of a sudden, at the end of 1989, the buffer's gone. And Ukraine is just a short march away from the internal parts of Russia. So they've lost their buffer. They've been attacked by <coughs> the Swedes, they've been attacked by the French, they've been attacked by the Germans. We can make a big list, and this is part of their cultural memory. And when you're getting involved in Russia, in the sense of getting involved in Ukraine, you're well within their legitimate concerns. And I don't think we thought carefully about that. Though I'd argue that the expansion of NATO into the other places was a very legitimate response to their historical concerns, meaning the other nations. We'll start the next question with Will. <clears throat> um, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland, who had been uh, working in Ukraine, uh, has described Russian actions in Ukraine as an, quote, invasion. Do you agree? Um, so, uh, Nuland is, a, is an interesting character. It's kind of a, a juicy question. Um, Newland is the uh, the U.S. State Department head of European affairs. Uh, she's a uh, um, she's married into the Kagan family. Um, uh, her husband and two of her in-laws each head up a uh, militarist neocon think tank. Uh, she and her whole family are heavily invested in the military industrial complex. Um, as far as folks in the State Department who could be handling this, I think Newland is probably exactly the wrong one. Um, you know, there are lots of qualified folks who are, would not push things the way I think Newland is trying to. Um, you know, calling it an invasion, uh, we have the tendency to, you know, we, when, when uh, there's an interest that we are pursuing, uh, we're doing it in the name of freedom, democracy, human rights, uh, and uh, that tends to be purely rhetorical. It has very little to do with tactics, act, uh, the actions, the in, who initiated force, uh, and a lot more to do with who our government and our, uh, and, and I think uh, our media, as they are very well connected to our government, um, you know, who they are wanting to demonize. That words like invasion, uh, aggression, um, and we're not calling the current actions in Yemen an invasion or aggression, we're, uh, we're calling them liberation or something like that. Um, so I, I think that, that the the use of the word invasion there, like sure, uh, you know, the, certainly Russia, uh, by the definition of inv invasion, invaded Crimea. Um, but I also think we need to be very, very careful about uh, about what words we use, and uh, and I think we need to be very careful when we listen to Victoria Newland. Passing down to the line. Well, so what's an invasion? Uh, if you've got tanks and artillery pieces and organized units there where people are Russian soldiers, that can be considered an invasion. Um, the Crimean circumstance is not the question, so let's stay away from the Crimean for the moment because that's another can of worms. But I wouldn't call it an invasion. I would call it an, a response, an action. A, there are people there that the Russians are concerned about. They're concerned about a large number of ethnic Russians, and it's hard. I'm not sure who Ukrainian is. If you look at Ukraine history, the people in the West mostly are Poles. They became Ukrainians at the end of World War II when Poland moved west, and the Soviet Union moved west also. And over on the east, 
we've got an awful lot of people who are ethnically Russian. In fact, most Ukrainians I know are from a family which is one Ukrainian speaking, and I'm not exactly sure if Ukrainian has been a language around a long time, and the other is a Russian speaker. So there's a legitimate concern about how you're going to treat these people. But I would suggest that the response that they had was too hard. There was no reason to act at that stage of the game because no, no damage had been done to them. I think this was an opportunity that the Russians took. Uh, invasion or not, they used it as an excuse to make difficulties for the Ukrainians, the state, and to make it possible that they could expand themselves into an area which they want to have a fair amount of control for. That there are Russian soldiers on the ground. Uh, you just don't take a bunch of people from the streets and the factories of a steel place and make them into tank commanders and the battalions and artillery commanders and all the rest. So this is, this is not the case. Now, I don't have the intelligence, I mean, my intelligence up here, perhaps I don't have the information to judge what's there, but there's no question in my mind there is Russian influence militarily in the area and it's shown up considerably in various times. Is that an invasion? Okay. Was it in an invasion had some purpose which is beyond just taking Kuwait or something like that? Yeah. Is there a degree of legitimacy from the standpoint of the Russian approach to doing this? Yes. Should they have done it as they've done it? I'd say no. Should they have done it when they did it? No. I'd say when you want to do this, you do it when harm is beginning to show up, when you see your Russian compatriots suffering to some degree. And they weren't. This was an opportunistic activity. Well, it's not, in, from my point of view, a full-scale invasion, because Russia is certainly capable of fully invading eastern Ukraine, and it chose not to. It chose to pursue a different strategy, one of creating tensions and instability, um, keeping the new Ukrainian government um, very much preoccupied with a very difficult situation. Um, so it's a tactical decision by Moscow. Um, calling it an invasion indeed seems to serve some other political um, objectives within certain circles of the US government, perhaps, um, which is not to say that the Russian actions are legitimized from my point of view. When we take ethno-nationalism as a legitimate reason for violating internationally agreed upon borders, um, we would in fact return to the 19th century, um, which is not to say that um, the Ukrainian state as it is currently constituted is you know, perhaps um, a viable nation state for all eternity. Um, but we, I think, need to be very careful um, to distinguish between what could be seen as legitimate invasions, if you want to use that language indeed, or illegitimate invasions. Um, on some level, <laughs> what we're talking about is um, a very crass breach of internet, very basic international law. Um, and regardless of the underlying issues, um, that is you know, pretty much um, factually determined. So um, while you know, one can find v plenty of reasons for why Russia may feel wrong, that does not mean that their actions in Ukraine can be justified. Now, let me add something back. Sure. John raised a point. At the end of the Cold War, we in the United States were very concerned that we were going to end up with the Soviet Union splitting apart into three nuclear states, actually four. And we worked very hard to try to make sure that all these nuclear weapons ended up in Russia and didn't end up in at least one case, Ukraine, the other Russia, Belarus, being the other Kazakhstan being the fourth. A treaty was signed saying, okay, you guys give up your weapons to Russia and we, the Russians, will agree that your borders are, as John was talking about, to the degree that can be an international relations sacred. What was Putin's response when he did what he's done? Well, we're not the same government that signed that <laughs> treaty, and that's not the same government that signed it on the other side. Well, that's a sort of a strange answer. 
there is a, from that standpoint, and from that particular treaty, independent of the idea of borders are, are supposed to be sacrosanct, and there were signs that we go beyond that to the Helsinki agreements back with the Soviet Union that agreed that the borders in Europe were as they were then. Now, of course, as they were then did not include a, a fractured Soviet Union. And this is one thing people got very excited about then. We're giving the Soviets something which is concrete, and what we got in exchange for is the, Hel the Helsinki Agreement that you can make certain other decisions regarding human rights and how you determine who you want to work with, which were very powerful counters to that. There was a, there were at least two very strong international agreements that Russia violated. Now, the violation of degrees is we've been faulted in the same fashion. We tend to edge into areas too, and they've edged into areas. I think invasion is the wrong term, but I would also say there's no question that they have militarily become involved. There's an Economist magazine recently I gave my students to read, and my students unfortunately read the first part of it and agreed that it was all truth. There was a statement in there that said that we had given so much money to the Ukraine in order to have nuclear weapons in the Ukraine. And the students didn't read very carefully, alleged. And they picked that point up, and it, 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 the next essay they wrote, this became fact. Well, this is what the Soviets, we go back to 81%. 81%, they're being told things which are not true. But we're not so sure what truth is here. And you've indicated <coughs> the problem. I'm, I'm going to uh, move into this next question, uh, Lionel, because uh, it, it some, relates somewhat to what you were just talking about. It, and that's, uh, there's abundant evidence that the U.S. has played a role in the color revolutions in former Soviet states like Georgia and Ukraine, and the expansion of NATO into countries on Russia's western borders seems to be a violation of uh, agreements, I would say, uh, unwritten agreements uh, made at the end of the Cold War, for example, statements by uh, Secretary of State Baker. Uh, uh, does Russia have a legitimate concern that these facts represent a threat to its national security? Um, if I were a Russian in the mindset they've got, I'd say yes. Um, their attitude in large, if you go back and look at one of the problems by looking at Russia, we're not sure who Russia is, we're not sure who the United States is for that matter. But Russia has, I mentioned earlier, this attitude, they're, they're Asian, they're European, they're neither, they're themselves, they're, they are the Christian folks that took over the Christian mantle when Rome fell and Constantinople state, they are very, got a very strange view of who and what they are. And one of the things they don't want to be is they don't want to be like the United States and Western Europe. And with that attitude, and I think John said earlier, the idea that the Western Europeans and Americans had that this movement that we saw going into Eastern Europe and perhaps even washing into the former Soviet states was the word westernized is perhaps too strong, but it was to bring with it Western attitudes towards democracy, towards human rights, towards the way people behave towards each other, and perhaps to some degree towards religions. So if you're standing there and you're looking at your national security more broadly than just the idea of terrain, but in terms of your language, your culture, your religion, and who you are, yeah, these are threats. But we, I don't think our efforts in these countries were efforts against the Soviet Union, against Russia. They were efforts to support things that we thought were appropriate. Um, but if you're a Russian, you're going to perceive these as direct threats, in some cases, to uh, who you are and what you are. And the issue of identity has been a critical issue for the Russian population upon the end of the Soviet Union. Perhaps just to add to that, um, I think the issue of identity is, is in fact crucial. And if you listen closely to what Russia is saying, uh, what they're often saying is, if you had only talked to us in the 1990s about what you want to do in Eastern Europe and what you want to do with NATO, things would have gone differently. Now, um, do we take the word for it? Um, that's, a, that's a very difficult question. Um, I don't think that Russia under the Yeltsin regime had a lot of clearly defined strategic interests. 
and they were caught up in regional wars in Chechnya, for example, um, they clearly did not have a strategy that would say, this is where we want to be 10, 15 years from now. This is where we want to be vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Um, so when there is that accusation level towards NATO, towards the West, that they just encroached into uh, the Russian sphere of influence, um, that is not completely unwarranted, but on the other hand, I am not sure how much of a difference it really would have made, uh, which is not to say that um, I wouldn't go as far as to say that Russians have a deep dislike of Western-style democracy. Um, it just so happens that democracy is historically an alien concept to the Russian polity. Doesn't mean that this has to stay that way forever. Um, but to say that by simply having been a little bit nicer or you know, more forthright towards Russia would have changed everything seems a tad naive to me. So I, I think um, given uh, historical perspective, uh, the last century of uh, US involvement in the world, um, when you look at places like Argentina, Chile, uh, Indonesia, um, certainly the US has not always been on the side of human rights or democracy. Um, we've always been on the side of the folks who are backing our politicians financially. Um, and I, uh, I, I think that there, there is a very legitimate uh, concern there of, uh, of the Russian state when they're, when they're looking at, um, at NATO continuing to expand in their direction. Um, and, I, and I think um, you know, the idea that, that that expansion is about democracy and freedom and human rights is, is a little naive. Um, and, and I think it ignores a good portion of what the US has been doing uh, for the last few decades. So I, I think that there's a very legitimate uh, concern for Russian security. I'm going to start with Jan on this <clears throat> next question. Uh, there appear to be divisions between the US and its European allies most notably in last month's Minsk agreement on the most effective way to deal with Russia. What are the possible consequences of these divisions? In, indeed, um, I think from a European perspective, the Ukraine issue really hit them squarely in the face out of nowhere. They really got sucker punched. And a lot of it has to do with the fact how Europeans have conceptualize the issue of security within the European Union. This is a highly evolved supranational institution. It is, in many ways, the most complex institution of international law ever created. And for most member states of the European Union, this is what international relations is, an issue for lawyers. It's about trade, it's about the economy. Um, and most of the EU member states, of course, can afford to have very, very small defense budgets because they live under the US security guarantee. And they believe that this was the natural order of things. So all of a sudden, a guy like Putin or whoever's in charge of Russian foreign policy comes along and completely changes the rules of the game and plays international politics by 19th century rules, not by 21st century rules. And nobody in the EU was prepared for it. Now, for better or worse, and uh, Robert Kagan was mentioned before, right? Uh, if we um, wrongly, I believe, assume that Americans are from Mars and Europeans are from Venus, <laughs> and Europeans live in a Kantian world, and Americans leave, live in a Hobbesian world, right? For Americans, dealing with international conflict is a normality. That's what they have been doing for basically a century. Um, Europeans used to be good at that. And they are no longer adept at it. Um, that, to me, explains on, on the one level why the responses are different. On the other hand, of course, there is the fact that Russia is Europe's direct neighbor and there are incredibly close economic ties, especially between Germany and Russia. 
There are also a lot of Europeans who tend to be quite sympathetic to the Russian security concerns. Um, I can um, speak very uh, closely to the security discourse in Germany, for example. It is well known that the former Chancellor Schroeder is one of the closest friends of Vladimir Putin. Um, lots of German politicians have spoken out in favor of Russia, have even um, you know, brought up the idea of a German reorientation towards Eastern Europe and Russia serving as a bridge between the West and Eastern Europe uh, and Russia rather than um, you know, squarely being a member of NATO and the West. Um, so the fact that Germany's influence has risen so greatly in the European Union does explain, I think, why the differences between the EU and, um, and the United States with regards to Russia are considerable. Now, having said all that, um, when you look at what European leaders have actually been doing, they have been trying to put pressure on Putin in the only way they know how, meaning through diplomacy and economic sanctions. Now, for certain members of the US Congress, this is going to look like a terribly weak response, of course. Um, one could argue, of course, that for Europe, its security is so much more at stake when it comes to Russia than for the United States, which can now look at Russia as a regional problem, um, that it may also be understandable that Europeans tend to be more hesitant, more cautious in their response. Um, despite these differences I mentioned, I do not see a fundamental divide between the EU and the US with regard to Russia. There's different opinions with regard to the right approach, um, but if we try to understand Russia's game at trying to divide the West, I don't see that this has succeeded yet. Let me put this sort of historical circumstance. I served, I guess, uh, five years in NATO headquarters with the ambassador, two years as Secretary of Defense in NATO areas, and was sent intentionally to, the, to Denmark because the concern was that Denmark was going to take the French-Spanish approach and sort of a la carte decide how it wanted to be in NATO. But an interesting aspect of watching that, and the problem we had at NATO headquarters and all those locations I was talking about with the people at home, they kept on saying that we had gone native. We took the European position. The American position generally was in things in Europe militaristic generally, because we had the capabilities. And we pushed those things, where the European approach quite often was the opposite. It's, it's unfair to distinguish one militaristic and one not. But generally speaking, the European approach was, let's look at things a little differently. When we're pushing in the United States a new uh, security concept for NATO that JFK wanted and Robert Kennedy, no, not Robert Kennedy, but Robert McNamara wanted, the Europeans said, well, that's fine, but let's talk about something broader than that. Let's talk about Europe in a much broader way. And they started talking about another way to look at Europe politically, economically, socially. The Europeans have been doing this since the beginning of NATO. And we've been a little bit too strong, I would suggest, on the military side. And they've been a little bit too weak on the other side. But they pulled our chestnuts out of the fire, and we pulled theirs out because we see the issue from a variety of ways. And this is what John is talking about. They've got another set of interests. Things have changed in NATO to be secondary to the United States views. It's not as critical as it used to be. And they're going to emphasize their interests and their concerns. And we're going to consider, continue to emphasize ours in a different way, too. So this distinction that we see is not unusual. In fact, if we want to go and talk about the effort of the current Russians to split NATO in certain ways using political influences within the domestic sphere, all one has to go back to is just before Gorbachev takes power is something called intermediate um, missile system. They had SS-20s and we brought systems in. The Europeans didn't like our weapons. 
And the question was, why don't you like don't like ours and you don't mind the Soviets? Well, there was a major concern there that we were going to end up having a split within the alliance because the <laughs> European governments were going to take a separate view on these. Well, naturally they're gonna take a separate view. The population has separate views on these. They're democratic societies. So I don't, I don't see this as a problem. I see this as how they operate and have been operating in years, and we tend to operate a little differently. We've got one political party that tends to look at things. Let's take military force in a little early. I get nervous about that. And my view is, if you wanna go early, send your children. Don't send mine. Um, we've got another political party that tends to think, has led also, I can't, both of them have been sort of strange in terms of you've talked about it, some of their behavior. And I, quite often the Europeans, though I don't think they are angels by any stretch of the imagination, have been somewhat pulling us back in and saying, just be a little more careful. But in this case, there's a very strong economic tie that makes it very difficult for the Europeans to be aggressive, even economically aggressive. And this is a problem we're going to talk about, I guess, in one of the questions. I want to get Will's reaction to that question. Another, another really juicy one, but it was well covered. Um, the, uh, as far as the, the, the tensions go, I, I think it, you could certainly say there are tensions between uh, Chancellor Merkel and uh, General Breedlove, the NATO commander. Uh, there are tensions between the Chancellor and uh, Victoria, Victoria Newland. Um, but for, most, uh, for the most part, the State Department uh, and President Obama have, have been pretty consistent that, that you know, I, I think their position is a little closer to what, uh, where most of Europe is. I don't think that there's been a, a major divide there. Um, you know, there are some players who are uh, being really aggressive in this that uh, I, think, and I think irresponsible in many ways. Uh, I think Breedlove really wants to make his name, wants to be the next Petraeus and thinks this is his chance. Uh, I think there are some people who are really playing a dangerous game. Uh, but for the most part, I, I think that our State Department uh, isn't that far off from where uh, where the Europeans are at this point. I'm going to cut down to uh, another question. Let's see, who are we starting off with? We're starting off with Will this time. Uh, uh, um, and it's the last question I had. And we didn't really have these in any kind of order. But, uh, but since the end of the Cold War, Americans have become used to the idea of a unipolar world. Does the reemergence of Russia as a world power and its economic alliances with, for example, the other BRICS nations, and I would add to that, uh, since I wrote this, the uh, new Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that uh, a number of European countries are signing on to as well, um, uh, does the, do these economic alliances uh, represent a threat to American hegemony, specifically the hegemony of the dollar as a global currency? Um, there have been some threats to the hegemony of the dollar. As far as uh, military hegemony, absolutely not. Uh, I mean, we're spending about 45% of the world's uh, military dollars right now. Uh, and when you include our NATO allies, uh, that quickly goes up over 60%. Uh, you need an alliance of the entire rest of the world to, to pose any sort of uh, challenge. And certainly we're not gonna see uh, most of most of the world is gathering together their forces to oppose us anytime soon. Um, as far as uh, a currency he hegemony, um, as long as we're keeping uh, the oil trade uh, where it is, it's, energy continues to be the largest trade out there. Um, I don't see it being a significant threat, although I definitely don't work at the Federal Reserve, and uh, there there are folks on this panel who certainly know more than I do about that. So the question kind of, as a matter of fact, states that Russia has re-emerged as a world power. And I'm not sure to what extent that is true. Um, it is a global power due to its nuclear arsenal. But in terms of its actual reach, it is a regional power, uh, despite the vast land mass that the Russian state controls. Um, I think that Russia has great potential for being a continual nuisance in global affairs for many, many states. Um, but in strategic terms, it, it seems to me at least 
um, inconceivable that Russia could ever again become a rival to American power in the same way that we conceptualize, for example, a rising challenger like China. Right? Certainly, uh, when we talk about a threat to American hegemony, uh, we need to be talking about China and perhaps eventually about India. Um, frankly, even the European Union, to me, seems a more credible challenger to American hegemony should it ever decide to become a military power. Now, that is very unlikely. Um, but Russia, despite its geography, despite its nuclear arsenal, um, and despite its national identity, I don't think can be a credible world power in the near or even long-term future. Let me take, uh, I don't know the right word, I don't believe in polarity. I don't believe in hegemony. I think both of those are concepts that led us down strange paths bipolar world was not bipolar. It was bipolar only by those that looked at it from the standpoint of a political military conflict. It was very complex in all the other aspects, especially economics. Uh, polarity. We had never been unipolar. At the end of the Cold War, sure, we could have destroyed the world along with other people. We could stomp on anybody else. We can guarantee uh, that our ships can go anywhere in the world, pretty much unless you get too close up to the coast and we can fly everywhere we want to. But hegemony has never been or should never be just something militarily considered. If we look at all the other things, and what's been happening in the world, especially since the Cold War was over, is a rise of other people, other organizations, other states, other non-states, who have the ability to influence outcomes. We're not the only state that can do that. If we were a hegemonic state, how come we have so much trouble trying to get the Iranians to change their views? How come we have so much trouble with the Russians? Why do we have trouble with the Germans? We tell them, get the hell out of here. <laughs> no, we don't do that because we can't. We do not have the relative power to tell people what to do. And the hegemon, in large measure, should have that, if you want to call it to exist. I believe in a pluralist world. We are, in many cases, the most effective, the most capable state in the world. We can influence things considerably. But we just can't always get what we want. John raised the point a moment ago. We've got all sorts of economic concerns being developed. At the end of World War II, we essentially, with the British, created the world economic system to suit our needs and other people's needs too. That's changing. The World Bank is changing. The International Monetary Fund is changing. The way we deal with trade changes. A lot of things are changing. And why are they changing? because there are other economic powers that have the ability to influence outcomes. So I would suggest we get rid of the idea of the United States as a global as a global hemogen. I don't know how you pronounce that word. I mean, <laughs> or, or there, there is a bipolar world. Polarity brings with it the idea of power, coercive power. And the strength of the world in large measure is not coercive power. We see coercive power in the Ukraine and Crimea and elsewhere. But the strength of the world in large measure is through not, I'm not talking about soft power, that's a terrible term, but in non coercive ways to try to achieve what you want to achieve. If you're religiously inclined, uh, we've gotten away from it in the West. Maybe they haven't gotten away from it in certain aspects in the Middle East. If you're economically inclined, the way to get resources prior to World War II, like the Japanese, you go and you beat up on the colonial powers in the Americas. <coughs> What did we do when the OPEC states decided they wanted to raise the price of it? Really, to have the largest transfer of wealth? Did anybody go to war with them? No, we accepted it because that was within how we did economic things. The world has become very, very pluralist. There are some big states, but there's some huge multinational corporations. There are regimes, they are non-government organizations, there are interest groups, there are all sorts of people out there who can make things happen. In my view, the most critical things in the world today are not state-state issues, but they're the transnational issues which are hard to, to overcome, hard to deal with, and you don't deal with it because you are the strength of big power. You deal with it through negotiations and dealing with other states and move along and try to accomplish tasks that are beyond the capacity 
of any one state. So it's not that I disagree with the question, I just disagree with the, the attitude, and it is a natural attitude. We're used to being the big dog on the block. There are a lot of big dogs on the block. But anyhow, you take the particular views, I just feel very strongly against the idea that we're hegemon, should act as a hegemon, and we forget the concept of relative power, and there's a large number of organizations and things that can influence the world development. Uh, this may be uh, related, I guess, uh, well, uh, maybe we'll start with Jan here. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's related to the uh, previous question, which probably was a little inartfully worded. I meant uh, no, it's... It to be that. Uh, I'm, word no, I meant it, it, it's power, it's emergence as a, as a power in alliance with these, uh, with uh, countries like China, you know, certainly the BRICS, since there's a new BRICS uh, conference coming up I think, in the next couple of months. Uh, and I think uh, Russia tomorrow takes over as the chair of the BRICS uh, conference. Uh, but anyway, uh, the next question I want to move to is, what role do energy and the dynamics of the global economy play in the current tensions between the U.S. and Russia? This is related to the last question. Um, certainly a enormous role, no question about it. Um, Russia is the single most important provider of energy for the European Union. Um, lots of countries in the European Union would have a very hard time to secure their energy supply without Russia. Um, that means that for the European Union, it is very difficult to take an assertive role towards Russia um, it's even more difficult when their natural inclination to respond to um, political crisis is to use diplomacy or uh, diplomatic or economic sanctions. Now, with regard to the US and Russia relationship, um, I see it more as a problem of potential um, because the um, economic relationship between the U.S. and Russia is nowhere near as close or foundational as the one between Russia and the European Union. Um, so in many ways when we you know, try to talk about how the U.S. And, and Europe approach Russia differently, it is because in a crucial way Russia is more important to Europe than it is to the United States. You know, some of you in this room are at least as old as I am. You might remember during the Reagan administration, there was a strong effort by the United States to deny the Europeans the steel to be able to make pipelines between Russia, or in those days, the Soviet Union, and Europe. Why? They could see that if you had the pipelines, Europe, Russia, in those days, the Soviet Union, would have the ability to do exactly as John is talking about to some degree control the behavior of our allies. Well, and that plan or that effort fell, naturally fell. But the fact of the matter was that this was going to happen. Economically, the resources that Europe needed to have were going to come from Russia. But the North Sea was not sufficient, elsewhere was not sufficient. So what we're seeing is the application of economic power, which is an extraordinary capability if you have the control over the means of production. OPEC is another example. And so if you are somebody who relies upon it, you're going to have to adjust to that and make that interest much more significant to you than maybe somebody like us, so we're, we're fracking oil all over the place, so we don't need to worry about that. And so, so if you're an American, you need to look at the Europeans, and this is one of the problems we quite often have, we expect everybody to see things as we see things. Our opponent, we want him to see things the way we see things. In this case, the Europeans have a very logical concern. All of y'all have lived in New Hampshire through not the coldest month of February and March ever. I saw it a day before I got here. It was the tenth coldest. But if you looked at the little chart they had, there were only six days where the temperature was above 40. How would you like to be in Europe if someone turned the pipelines off. 
that would make you guys a little, me too, a little concerned. And that I think is a legitimate thing to realize. There are going to be different interests, and you're going to, with different interests, you're going to take different approaches. How are you going to deal with it? I think the Europeans have done extraordinarily well in standing up to Russia, given the fact that Russia could have done more damage to them than they wanted to. But on the other hand, I think Russia's a pretty good economic bunch of guys. They don't want to cause problems, but if you do it too much, what are the Europeans going to do? They're going to find other sources of energy in the future to resolve the problem, and they're doing this already. Yeah, I agree with that. This is a, a, a very significant problem for the Europeans. Will you? Well, we go ahead and pass it down to Will. Uh, since we're getting so late here, I want to consolidate a couple of questions and make this the last question and then open it up uh, to the audience. Um, uh, the question would be, one characteristic of the old Cold War was proxy wars in the so-called Third World. Since the Syrian government has long been allied with Russia, does the U.S. support for Syrian rebels make the conflict in Syria a proxy war in the new Cold War? How about Iran? Or how about Ukraine? And is there a threat of a nuclear confrontation in the new Cold War as there was in the original? Wow. Um, so Syria, uh, I, I think that um, considering the proxy war between the U.S. and Russia would be a, a bit of an oversimplification, um, but there's certainly elements of that. Um, you know, there's certainly uh, support uh, for fact, well, and, and which factions we're supporting has certainly changed over the past year. Um, over the past week. Yeah, over the past week, you know, we, we, we pretty regularly are, are changing uh, exactly how we're trying to, to interact with Syria, uh, but Assad certainly received uh, some propping up uh, for a time from us and later from Russia, and uh, certainly uh, ISIS uh, is something that uh, we, we dumped a lot of money and arms in to oppose Assad, and a lot of that ended up in, uh, in some places that we, with, in hindsight, we probably should have made sure it didn't wind up. Um, and although I, I, I don't think that that was the core of what created ISIS, I think ISIS is mostly the eight and nine year old boys whose families I pointed a gun at 10 years ago uh, who are pretty darn convinced that they need to do everything they can to fight the empire. Um, uh, Iran being a, when, we, when you go to the end of that question, you look at Iran, um, you know, I, I, I don't think we could call uh, that a, a proxy war between uh, the US and Russia at all. In fact, I, I think on some levels, the, the US is being used through our electoral funding system as a, as a proxy state uh, by uh, the Likud party and, and folks who are funding APAC. Um, so I think there's, a, uh, you know, there, there's actually a, a, a kind of a reverse proxy state there where you have a smaller, less wealthy state um, that's able to exert some influence uh, on a larger state to use this as a, in a, in a uh, use this as a, as a hammer. Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't call the, uh, the Iran a, a proxy war between Russia and, and the US. So. Um, I just referred to Russia as a, a possible nuisance for the US. And I think you're right that Syria is not a proxy war. But what we certainly see now have been seeing for a while is that Russia does have a strategy of limiting American influence whenever possible. Um, Russia does not like to give America free reign in their foreign policy and when they can use their political power uh, through the UN Security Con Council or other means, they are going to use it. Um, we don't know what would have happened in Syria had there been a UN resolution early on. I mean, right now, uh, not even the U.S. itself is interested in interve intervening, but it may have been interested in intervening two or three years ago. Now, I'm not saying that would have been a wise choice. Uh, maybe we're better off for that it hasn't happened, um, but the main reason it didn't happen is Russia. Um, Iran seemed to be an issue where Russia had its own interests. Uh, Seeing the negotiations unfold, it seems that Russia is more willing to actually work with Western powers on this particular issue. 
um, be interesting to see what is the actual outcome of um, the ongoing talks. Um, and lastly, there was a question about nuclear weapons. Uh, nuclear confrontation, uh, can we? Uh... Yes, I, I mean, I mentioned this before. I think this is the only thing that makes the current situation resemble the old Cold War. And I think that there hasn't been there hasn't been a deep change with regard to nuclear politics, but what we are seeing, and there's been a great article on this in uh, foreign policy recently, is that in Russia and in the United States, there are worrying signs that uh, nonproliferation may in fact take a backseat to a modernization of the nuclear arsenals, and we may see a renewed um, sort of, I don't want to call it an arms race, that's perhaps, you know, take things too far. But there's going to be a renewed focus on rebuilding nuclear arsenals, which is in a way a step back to where we were a few years or decades ago. Uh, so I see nuclear weapons potentially become a bigger issue in the future. Right now, however, and I'm not saying that we should unquestionably um, laud their uh, potential for deterrence, but right now, if anything, I see them more as a stabilizing factor. Well, let's look at the Cuban Missile Crisis I have here. It says, could Ukraine become the next Cuban Missile Crisis? The critical thing about the Cuban Missile Crisis was that both sides started out looking at the wrong thing. They both were looking at the Cuban what was happening in Cuba. And eventually, within that short period of time, both sides came to the conclusion that the most important national priority, national interest for both of them was no nuclear bombs or weapons falling on their populations. Once they reached that stage, and I give uh, Khrushchev the, as the guy who sort of saw it first. If you look at the tapes, you, our cave people are pretty much, you know, let's get rid of the people in Cuba. But once they reached that stage, they started negotiating in earnest. And the crisis was resolved through negotiation. Putin recently has talked about first use. We have always resolved, reserved to ourselves the first use of nuclear weapons. Recently, I guess it was about three years ago, there was a new nuclear policy set out by this administration talking about under what circumstances would we use nuclear weapons first. The alliance has within its strategic doctrine first use. As long as first use is there, it's got to be made credible in some fashion. How do you make it credible? You do what Putin says. Well, if I get pushed too hard, I might have to resolve, re revert to this or use this. And he sort of said this recently. So as long as people are thinking about using weapons first, you have the possibility they can be used. Hopefully what you have when it happens, when people start thinking like this, and I can't see the Ukraine as being a crisis of this sort, that when they reach that stage, they sort of ask the question, what's the outcome going to be? And it puts us back in a very strong analogy to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The attitude was, the outcome's not what we want. We can figure out some way to get out of this. We can give you something, you can give us something, and we get out of it without having to go, and go to war. Part of the problem with the Cuban Missile Crisis was that we understood something and didn't understand something about the, the Soviets. We had fairly good control over our nuclear weapons. The Soviet military in Cuba controlled the nuclear weapons there. If we had invaded, it would have been nuclear war. And you've got to be careful of these kinds of things. And we have a lot of experience, we and the Russians and the Soviets, a lot of experience of how to try to control this. And so hopefully, we're much further down the road of controlling the use of weapons and to the point of never using them. And we keep them in the stage where we're going to be, uh, I would call it mutual assured deterrence, that both sides say, you know, it doesn't make sense to use them. But the fact of the matter is that I, I, I see where John's coming from in terms of the uh, modernization of the equipments and the fact that neither side is going to continue to cut back the amounts, and the non-proliferation treaty says, hey guys, you the big guys, you have to cut things back, because we the little guys agree to this. You cut back and we will agree to non-proliferation. And neither the Russians or the United States have played their part of the role properly. 
So is there a threat there? Uh, yeah. Is there a threat that we should be afraid of? Yes. Is there a threat that we can expect to happen? No, because I just have a lot of confidence in people's ability when crises come to control their emotions and their attitudes. 